Hey, we're going to talk today about some things that you really need to be aware of, okay? Some of you have problems with relationships, okay? Right? Yeah, sometimes you find that your relationships are maybe a state of, uh, I guess you might say, um, conflict every once in a while, right? This seems to be unresolved. Others of you, relationships, man, that's your strong part in life. I mean, you're good. I mean, you, you, you have, you know, everything's, you know, goes pretty well, pretty consistently and all that. Well, we're going to talk about that today, and we're going to begin this series that we're calling Resilient Relationships. Now, in the first series of this year, we, we talked about the fact that we really wanted to push three really incredibly important principles for us in order to basically improve how we live our lives, all right? And those things being resilience, developing resilience. The other thing is understanding what it means to take risks in life. And then the third is making sure that our relationships are healthy, right? So we're going to consolidate a couple of those principles in this next series that we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks. And we're calling it Resilient Relationships. Resilience means that, you know, when I get knocked down, I get back up and I stay in the game and I'm working to make things, you know, move forward. And, you know, I, I, I'm just moving forward all the time, right? We need to have that quality in our relationships. And so what we're going to do today is begin this series by taking a look at what I think is probably the most authoritative passage of Scripture in the New Testament on relationships. Now, it's tucked inside of a, 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 a a passage or a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. And by the way, Pastor Ray, when he begins our midweek next Wednesday night, is going to be focusing on this very book, this very letter over the next few months and dissecting it because there's so much there. So I'm going to give you a little sneak preview without stealing any of his thunder at Ephesians chapter 4 today. Because it is in Ephesians chapter 4 that I believe we understand and learn some of the the attributes of positive relationships. And so I want to start off today uh, by sharing with you uh, some, a little bit, I guess you might call it some research, by an Australian nurse named Bonnie Ware. Now, Bonnie spent the last part of her, well, not the last part, but yeah, probably the latter part of her career working in palliative care, in other words, hospice care, uh, with her patients there in Australia. And there are some things that she observed that were pretty important, pretty eye-opening, uh, that I want to share with you uh, today. So she Asked, she would ask patients all the time about what they enjoyed about life, but also what they might have regretted about life. And so I'm going to give you the top five things that she said patients would tell her that they regretted. Here's the first one. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life that others expected of me. That's number one, okay? living into what others felt that person should be instead of being true to herself. Here's the second one. I wish that I hadn't worked so hard. Now, this was very common among the guys, okay? It doesn't mean that all guys work hard, okay? Just want to make sure we got that, right? But that was a common one. I wish I hadn't have worked so hard because uh, this regret um, was, again, from a lot of males. Here's the third one. I wish I had the courage to express my feelings, I wish I had had the courage to express my feelings. Many people suppress their feelings in order to keep peace with others. Many patients develop illnesses related to bitterness and resentment that they carried as a result of not being able to do that. Here's the fourth one. I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. There were many deep regrets about not giving friendships the time and effort that they deserved. Everyone mentions their friends when they are dying. And finally, I wish that I had let myself be happier. Many did not realize until the end that happiness is really a choice. They had stayed stuck in old patterns and old habits. Well, what I want to talk with you about today is partially an effort to help us avoid regrets like these when the time comes, right? And for many of us, uh, guess what? The time is coming for this. This part of your life is coming, and it's closer now than it was yesterday. It's closer now than it was a week ago, a year ago, etc. And so how you live your life today will determine the level of fulfillment or the level of regrets that you will experience 
by the time that end comes. And so with that today, uh, I want us to talk about the key element of relationships. We're going to set the stage for you know, parenting, marriage, some things we're going to be going through here in the next few weeks. But I want to set the stage with this one word that we titled the message with today. And that word is authentic. That word is authentic. Chances are, if you struggle with relationships, you probably are not very authentic. If your relationships are really, you know, you're really managing them well and everything's good with that, then it's a good chance that your authenticity level is pretty important. It's pretty high, right? As a matter of fact, I want us to kind of start off with a little self-check, all right, a little checkup. And so with this, I'm going to give you four things that are hallmarks of people who live authentic lives. And as I give you these things, it's not on your outline, so you might want to write these down. I want you to kind of do the little self-assessment this week and uh, ask yourself how you're doing in these four areas. Better yet, ask those closest to you how you're doing in these areas. Now, if you are narrow-minded and naive, and to be honest with you, stupid enough, to believe that the only self-awareness you need is what you observe about yourself, <laughs> okay, then I hope to dispel that idea today. You need others around you to help you know and understand to the level to which you might be authentic or not authentic. So let's kind of look at four things that, that are hallmarks of authentic people. All right, here's, uh, the, do you regularly, first of all, admit mistakes and weaknesses? Do you regularly admit mistakes and weaknesses that you make, mistakes you make, weaknesses that you have? Or do you try to cover them up or do you try to make excuses for them, right? A lot of people, they kind of talk over mistakes and try to build a case. And the problem is when you do that, you're, but you're probably telling a lie anyway. And the problem becomes that you're going to have to tell another lie after that lie just to solidify the first lie. And at some point, the lies kind of fall apart, right? So do you readily admit mistakes and weaknesses? Now, believe me, there's a lot of people who have a real hard problem with this. There are people that I know professionally who they've never admitted mistakes and weaknesses. And so here's the second thing that kind of comes right on the hill on that. Do you regularly apologize and make amends? Now, if you have a problem with number one, you are automatically going to have a problem with number two. You see the relationship? Because if you don't admit mistakes and weaknesses, if you don't see that, you've certainly not done anything to apologize for in the, in the first place, right? Again, you, like me, may know people who you, they never apologize. I hardly ever see them apologizing for anything they've done. When they, I'm sorry is like, I'm, I can't bring it out, right? And by the way, and we've talked about this before, but just remember this, particularly in marriages, but in professional relationships, in church relationships, friend relationships, all together, if your apology includes the word if, it's not an apology, okay? If your apology is for, I apologize to you, Miss Betty, if Pete offended you, right, with what he said, which he would never do, he would never do that. But he's always right, see, so there you go, so... But if the apology says, uh, I apologize to you if, then what does that do? I have transferred responsibility over to the other person. So uh, uh, if, I, if I offended you, all right, then I apologize. Well, and here's another way to read that. If you're immature enough and if you're fragile enough to have taken that in such a way that it offends you, then I apologize. But remember, the problem's yours because you're fragile and you took it as fence right? You see the point? So make sure that you eject the word if from your apologies. Don't even say it. And by the way, if, if, somebody, if somebody in this congregation that's hearing this message today, if, if you hear them, somebody in here says that to you, I apologize if, tell them that's not an apology right there. Pastor Bud said so, okay? Now that I will claim to be some authority on, all right, on that. That's just the reality of human nature. So uh, now, here's the other thing about apologizing and making amends. Guys, we need to remember this, all right? Because it took me a while to, to figure this out during marriage, right? Uh, because sometimes when we screw up, apology is not enough. They got to torture us a little bit. Have you noticed that, <laughs> right? That's, that, that's okay. It feels like torture, but it's really not, ladies. I know it's not. 
You're seeking us. You want, here's what you want. You want us simply to make amends. Now, guys, when we goober it up and we want to say, hey, I'm sorry, can we just move on? And she says, no, we can't move on. The reason we can't move on is because she wants not only the apology, she's got to have amends. What is amends? Amends takes time. And this is what tortures us, guys. This is the part that tortures us. Because it's never over until we demonstrate that we're not going to do it again. Okay? And depending on, depending on how long your wife's memory is, all right? All right, depending on stuff you might have screwed up on in the past, it may take a little longer to get to the amends part, all right? Because that's what amends is. We can take them to dinner, we can take them away for a romantic evening, etc., weekend, whatever. But, you know, until they have reasonable confidence that we're not going to goober it up again, we just got to live out our sentence, all right? It's kind of the way it is, all right? So just know that. It's important. So here's the third, uh, here's the third piece of the authenticity list do you regularly ask for help some people will not ask anybody for help because they fear that it demonstrates or makes others feel like that they themselves are insufficient okay if i ask somebody for help then does that mean that people think i can't do this myself or i'm deficient right and so you know you at work do you ask for help you know uh in your home do you ask for help etc and finally, uh, the fourth thing that's, uh, that's really important that we need to understand is, do you affirm others around you? Are you looking for things in others that you can affirm, that you can say positive things about, or is your first inclination to try to find what is negative about someone else or about something that they do, all right? It's one thing to be... A, 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 a discerning thinker. It's another thing to be a critical thinker. Many people are very critical, and that's the first thing that they go to is what is wrong, all right? Now, uh, now it, it, chances are if, if you have a problem with probably a couple of these, eh, maybe even one, you, got, you need to kind of figure out, am I really an authentic person? Because let me tell you, authenticity is the foundation for trustworthiness. If you are not authentic, people will have a difficult time trusting you. Does that make sense? And when people choose not to trust you, your credibility and your influence is going to be minimal. So here's the deal. If at work, or if at church, or in the neighborhood, if you're walking along, and you've noticed recently that people are sort of, when they see you coming, they kind of dart down another hallway, or they turn around and go the other way, guess what? They're trying to avoid you. And one of the reasons they might be trying to avoid you is probably due to some of the things we're going to talk about today, okay? So Ephesians 4. Paul is trying to get the church to understand how to live together. And he's trying to help them understand how we are to, to, to treat each other in the construct of the church, but also in terms of families and working relationships, etc. Now, I'm going to say some things today that you heard me say before, and you're going to say, well, bud, you said that before. Yes, I do, because I believe these are principles that cannot be repeated enough. All right? So repetition is important for all of us. And, and so I want us to start by looking at a verse that we looked at in the passage on the Sermon on the Mount that we kind of studied pretty deeply last year. And we find in Matthew 7, Jesus giving us some words that we have come to know as the golden rule. Okay, the golden rule. This should be really the hallmark of the way we live our lives. And so Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 12, do for others what you would like them to do for you, right? And so we've, you've probably quoted this at this some point in time in your life. Then we think that we need to live this way. And that's a great thing because Jesus said, this is a summary of all that is taught in the law and all the prophets. So this is what he says. He says, look, he said, if you want to do all those things that the Old Testament says... All those things that, that, that I am saying and that I'm going to say, it can all be summed up. Figure out the way you would want others to treat you, okay? And that's the way you treat others. Now, there are a number of things that Jesus says to qualify this. Some people, they have such a low 
self-esteem of themselves and their self-concept is so low that they only feel that, 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 that they, uh, they feel that people need to be bad to them. They need to be ugly to them, right? There are, there are disorders and diseases that people, not diseases, but disorders that people have because they don't think they're good enough. And so they like it when other people treat them badly. And so what happens? They treat other people badly in the process. But when we're healthy, we're, when we're aligned with God's principles of the way we should live our lives, and we use that as the barometer of how we treat others, Jesus says, you know what, you're doing everything, you're doing everything that the prophets talked about. You're doing everything the law says. You're doing all those things that I am trying to encourage you uh, to do. So what I want to do is transition from what Jesus said in the golden rule to go over to Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to look at seven values, I'd like to call them, of authentic people, of authenticity, all right? And, and so uh, if, if you want to be authentic, and hopefully you do, then Paul gives us seven things in, verse, in chapter 4 that would be good for us to look at. Now let me just kind of give you a layout of chapter 4. In the first couple of verses of chapter 4, he introduces this whole concept, this whole idea of treating each other uh, with authenticity, with I like the word vulnerability actually a little bit. Uh, actually, I don't like the word, but it's a good word because it, you know we, it sounds like weak, right? When I'm vulnerable, I'm weak. I don't like that word, but in reality, I have to appear that way. I have to I have to be willing to be open and unguarded. And so uh, with that, um, he talks about this in the first three or so, or so verses. Then, in the next uh, probably about 20 verses, he transitions over to some church operational kind of thoughts. And he says things like, you know, I've given, I've given to the church pastors and teachers and, you know, prophets and apostles, and their role is to equip the saints. And so the whole idea there, what he's saying is, the whole idea is the church itself, everyone is to serve. So this is why that passage in Ephesians 4, and I've told this many times over the years, this is why there will never be a sign anywhere out in our church that says Bud Wren Pastor, right? If we were to have a sign like that, it would say Pastor Everybody, <laughs> Minister Everybody, right? Because that's the biblical model for service, right? And, and, so, and so all of our staff members, all of our folks that their own professional staff, their first role is to serve, Right? We're, we're to help the rest of us, they're to help the rest of us focus on learning what it means to be ministers themselves. And so then he transitions back into what it means for us to treat each other with authenticity. All right, so, so you've had your little time to say, okay, am I, am I authentic? Where am I, where am I deficient? Where am I doing pretty well? And so let's look and see what these values are. Because the, the goal today, here's the, here's the big ask is for you to adopt these values intentionally and kind of put them out there and say, I am going to strive to live this way. Okay, here we go. Here's the first, here's the first value of authentic relationships, humility. Humility, okay? Humility, that's the first thing. If you're going to be authentic, you've got to be humble, okay? Now, that is not to say that all humble people are authentic, Okay? Largely because a lot of us struggle with what it means to be humble, okay? And so with that, uh, a lot of people think the humility is that when, uh, you know, when Barry or when Pastor Ray or when Chris or when someone comes to you and says, you know, I think you got a real talent for this and it would be really cool if you would consider using that in the service to the church or in the mission field, et cetera, da, 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 and you think, oh, no, Chris, Barry, I that's not me. I don't have any. That, I don't have any. That's not me. I'm not good at that. I'm not good at that. that's denying. That's that's not humility, and we think that's that's denying. That's denying the reality of how God made you, okay? And that is not the same thing. Is that that is false humility? That is denying the way God made you. And, and so with that, what is humility? Well, He gives it to us in the first couple of verses, and I love what He says here. He says, "Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord." Okay, beg. Now, what does it mean to beg? What does it mean to beg? Picture Paul on his knees before you. And if this is such an important point for him, 
what he's about to ask you to do, that he is willing to beg you. And what is it? I beg you to lead a life worthy of your, what's that word? What's that word? Your calling. You know, for many of us, we have ignored the idea that God has given us a calling and that he's the calling on our lives. And you know, we've just gone, oh, just, I'm just going to live my life the way, you know, the way and just kind of whatever, whatever comes. We have restructured our discipleship model. We're kicking it off today, as a matter of fact, at lunch. Many of you are joining us. You responded to my email. And our goal through our discipleship model is to help you come up with the, 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 the clarity of the calling on your life. Because the worst thing you can do is live your life, get to the end, and realize I missed my calling. I missed it. I missed it. That's another one of the regrets, by the way, that Bonnie Ware did not mention in her research. People who missed the purpose and the calling of their lives. And so he says, look, I'm a prisoner for serving the Lord. And I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. So there we have the definition of humility, which is coming to grips with your own identity, okay, getting it when it comes to your calling, your strengths and weaknesses, and leveraging them for the benefit of others. That's what Paul's telling us to do. That's the first value of authenticity, all right? Leveraging your strengths and weaknesses for the benefits of others. How do I leverage my weaknesses? I've just got to know. I don't need to be doing things in areas that I'm weak. But if I am taking things that I really have a strength, and as an excuse for not doing certain things, I call them a weakness, I deny the power of God. I say, God, you made a mistake the way you made me. You, you, you screwed up, God. You screwed up. You messed up. So, humility is important. Not all humble people are authentic because they downgrade themselves. A lot of them downgrade themselves and their strengths. And in doing so, they deny God. But, all authentic people are humble. You got to have humility in order to be authentic. Okay. Now, here's the second thing that he brings out in verse three. He's and it has to do with with uh, with unity, which I call that focusing on things that bring common ground. Okay. Authentic people are looking to try to find ways to find common ground with other people. Okay. Now, a lot of people this doesn't really matter. Have you ever? Have you ever? Have you ever? met someone, had an encounter with someone, and it didn't take you too long to realize that all they did was talk about themselves? Yeah? If, 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 if you didn't respond, chances are you're the one that one of us encountered who was just talking about themselves, all right? All right, maybe some of us are like that. We just talk about ourselves, right? Finding common ground is important. Now, here's what we do. A lot of times, the way we deal with people are based upon differences. I want to try to find what's different, and I want to focus on that. And a lot of times what that leads to, uh, particularly early in the relationship, uh, is tension. Okay, And so the point that, that Paul wants us to get is look for common ground, common ground with others to build healthy relationships. Always, Paul says in verse 3, keep yourselves united in the Holy Spirit and bind yourselves together with Peace. Now, in order to, all right, in order to um, unite, keep yourselves united in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has to be working inside you, okay? He has to have control. He is the operating system that is driving the way you think, the way you emote. And you do not have the Holy Spirit until you've given your life to Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that when we come to the place in our lives, when we recognize that we're sinners and that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and we accept him as our Savior, then the Holy Spirit becomes what we call Jehovah Shema, which is one of the names of God the Father, uh, and that's God the Holy Spirit. The indwelling presence of God is through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit kind of takes over, and when we're growing as Christ followers, what we used to think of as a conscious is really now kind of the Holy Spirit kind of coming through, right? He kind of leads us, directs us, he kind of probes us and prods us here and there, and he causes us to do it. And so he says, he says, look, through the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves united in the Holy Spirit, 
in the work that you are doing uh, in coming together and make sure that you do come together. All right, so, so there we go. There's our first two values, humility and unity, all right? If you want to be an authentic person, you got to understand this, all right? Particularly if you're growing to be more like Jesus, you got to go there. And if you're not yet growing to be more like Jesus, I beg, that you, I beg you on my knees, right? Paul did, to, to, to make the transition, to accept him as your savior and let him control your life. All right. So, um, and so, and so here's, uh, here's the next one. And kind of these next three kind of go together. All right. So now we're going to get these three values are going to help us deal with conflict management and conflict resolution. Okay. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you in detail a principle that I've only talked about in generalities uh, in the time we've been here. We're going to dissect this principle uh, about truth and conflict resolution. So here's the third value. Here's the third value of, um, the third value of, um, of authenticity. And it's simply honesty. Honesty. Which we, honesty, we know what that is. That's not rocket science kind of word. But this is really what honesty is about. It's about speaking uncompromised truth in ways that will benefit others. Okay? Now, some of y'all know how to speak uncompromised truth, but you may not do it in a way that benefits others. Okay? Some of us, we want to benefit others and make them feel good, but we're not really willing to speak uncompromised truth. We might flatter, and we might say things to people to make them feel good in the moment, even though it's not true. I call that rescuing. Okay? Sometimes people say, well, you know, I, I really messed up here, and I'm not doing a good job of this, or da-da-da. Oh, and I think you're doing just fine. I think you're doing fine, right? And, and, my, and when I'm working with businesses and churches, I say, don't rescue people. Don't rescue them because they're trying to get to truth. Now, it, it, let them speak and then maybe have conversations around this stuff. But anyway, here's the point. Speaking uncompromised truth. Where does uncompromised truth come from? Do we just manufacture it in our minds? Some of us think we do. Uncompromised truth is not what you manufacture in your minds. I hate to break that to you because some of you, I just burst a bubble for you, right? Uncompromised truth comes only from God's Word. It's the principles of alignment with God's Word. So speaking uncompromised truth in ways that will benefit others. So remember when Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians, he didn't go back and write, okay, chapter 1 begins here, chapter 2 ends, or 1 ends here, and 2 begins. He didn't do that, right? It was all one lengthy narrative, Okay, remember that. And so what I'm going to show you right now is really important for you to get, okay? And as we look at verses 25 and following. So he says, put away all falsehood, all right? Now, why did Paul say put away all falsehood? Because he knew in the church people were all the time feeding each other a bunch of bull crap. They were, right? Truth did not have a high value at that point. I, we would say things to people to get them to do things or to feel certain ways that may not be really in line with truth. And so put away all falsehood and tell your neighbor the truth because we belong to each other. Okay? You've got to be truthful. Right? Now, I'm not done with that. Right? Because remember what we said, speaking, speaking uncompromised truth in ways that will benefit. And so this is what I want you to understand. This is what I want you to see. First of all, honesty involves three things. Doing this involves three things. And we've talked about this before. It's a review. The three elements of speaking truth, right? Let's pull them up there, Pete. Pete, how you say it. Tone. That's the tone. That's the first T, right? The tone, the way you say something is important. You can have the second piece, which is the topic, the words. You can have all that right. But if your tone is not appropriate. This is why speaking out in anger is not a good idea. Speaking out in sarcasm sometimes may not be a good idea, right? You can have the topic right, the words, but the way you say it can obliterate the topic, okay? When emotion begins to take over, this usually happens. Tone is usually a product of emotion, okay? that overrides the words that we think of, okay? So tone topic, the third thing, which can also override everything else, is timing. Be careful 
knowing when you need to say something to someone. Now, let me tell you, this is not a license to put it off. Some people say, well, you know what? Uh, I don't think, I, I, now is not the right time. Pastor Bud said, you got to be the right time. Well, many of us would use that to say, well, I'm never going to talk about it. That's our intent, but I'm going to use the excuse of timing, right? So my timing's never going to quite be right. No, 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 that's not the way it should go. We've got to have tone, topic, and timing all in alignment. Okay, so let's go to the next value, which I call self-management. Okay, this is really important. Self-control, self-management. How well do you do at managing your emotions and your thoughts? Okay, when we have the Holy Spirit living in us, Galatians 5, 22, 23 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. These fruit of the Spirit are the things that should be active in our lives when the Holy Spirit's living in us and doing his thing. And so with that, when we have those fruit of the Spirit, that's what we mean by self-management. All that's working well. Self-management has to do with maintaining a consistent temperament. Are you consistent in your temperament? Or are you all over the map? Are you volatile? One minute you're up, one minute you're down. One minute you're mad, the next minute you're happy. You blow up here, you kind of settle down here. Are you consistent? If you're volatile, people, here's how people approach you. It's kind of like, is that, it's kind of like that thing right there, right? If you're volatile, this because they don't know when you're going to blow up, right? The other factory is eggshell people, okay? Eggshell people, we talked about eggshell people. You don't want to be an eggshell person. You might, that might be your issue. People are avoiding you in the hall at work, and they're kind of, that, they, that might be why they're avoiding you or people in the neighborhood or church or whatever the case might be. Eggshell people, you know, i got to be careful what I say because if I say the wrong thing, they're going to get hypersensitive and they're going to, they're going to pout or they're going to blow up, okay? And so, and, so, and so what's important here is maintaining a consistent, healthy temperament. And so look at what he said. Remember, these verses that we're looking at, 25, 26, and 27 are one continuous narrative. And let's figure out what Paul's saying. He says, so put away all falsehood and tell your neighbor the truth because we belong to each other. And then in verse 26 he says, and don't sin by letting anger gain control of you. Why does he say tell the truth and then in the very next sentence say, don't let sin, or, or don't sin by letting anger gain control of you? Why would he do that? Because when we speak uncompromised truth, even in ways that are healthy, it's a chance it could tick us off. If I were to talk to my friend Dennis back there, and Dennis were to tell me something in a loving way, just as gentle, and that's just who he is. He's just that kind of guy anyway, right? It could be that no matter what he says, how gentle he says it, I'm still going to get upset with him, okay? That's human emotion. Now, is that right? No, it's not right. But Paul was saying, when you speak truth, you can expect there to be an emotional reaction. Has anybody ever noticed that? Anybody ever figured that out in life? Okay, yeah, we figured that out, right? We got that, right? So there's logic in what he's thinking. So Paul tells us, speak uncompromised truth in ways that will benefit others, but make sure that when you hear that, maintain a consistent temperament. Don't get ticked off. Don't go off on Dennis. Don't get mad at Dennis and say that dirty, right? Don't do that. And so really... Uh, th this is where we need to make sure that we are kind and gentle and being authentic, all right? So, so don't, you know, it, it, that's important. So here's, here's the third part, the third of those values around conflict resolution and management, and the fifth of the values around authenticity is what I call peacemaking, okay? It's peacemaking, right? Now, let me say this. There is... A significant difference, kind of like night and day, between peacemaking and peacekeeping. All right? We are called to be peacemakers. You know what peacekeepers do? Well, you know, I kind of had, we had, you know, I had a little tiff with my, my sister-in-law, Tarina, and so we're just not going to talk about it. We're just going to act like it never happened. Okay? That's peacekeeping. All right? And lots, that's a lot of what we do. No, we don't, but that's what a lot of people do. Peacemaking, on the other hand, calls us to do what? To deal with the conflict, okay? So if you're a peacekeeper, 
don't get all high and mighty about it, okay? Because that is not in alignment with the virtues of authenticity according to what Paul says in Ephesians 4. If, on the other hand, you're a peacemaker, you're willing to go and deal with issues, okay, in order to bring improvements in the relationship and an authenticity in the relationship, then that's what God's after in us. So peacemaking is what I call real-time conflict resolution. What does the term real-time mean? What does it mean? Right now. Right now. When it happens, take care of it, okay? Now, but bud... I really need to let things simmer down. Or I got to have time to, you know, just kind of unwind or whatever before I do that. Well, that may be true. But I want you to look at the third sentence that Paul writes in this narrative that's very important. He says, Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for angry gives a mighty foothold to the devil. All right, so let's go back and let's look at this narrative again. All right? He says, first of all, what? He says, put away all falsehood and tell your neighbor the truth, neighbor the truth, because we belong to each other. And don't sin by letting anger gain control of you. When you speak the truth, you're liable to get angry and sin's possibly going to happen. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Because truth might hurt and because you might get angry, make sure you deal with it before the sun goes down. How often does the sun go down? Which is every how many hours? Okay, he says, take care of it in real time. Do not let it fester. Because what happens, I know what we do, I've done this. I, I don't really feel like I want to do it today. I've got to calm down, whatever the case might be. But you know what I found? Every moment that I wait to initiate a resolution of a conflict, the chances are, and statistics hold this up, the, chance, the, the chances of a positive resolution begin to decrease, to go down. This is why marriages, a lot of times, all of a sudden, everything's going, every, everything's just going, it looks like everything's going fine, all of a sudden, boom, right? Why? Because everything's been swept under the rug, because we haven't talked about it. All right, I'm just going to just deal with it, right? And then there becomes a breaking point. This is the genesis of passive-aggressive behavior, right? We don't deal with stuff. God did not make us to be equipped emotionally to handle this way of doing conflict. He made us in such a way to do real-time conflict resolution and to get things out on the table, deal with it, so you can move forward in an authentic, healthy fashion in your life. And so this whole narrative that Paul gives us, basically is just tell each other the truth, understand you're gonna, somebody's going to get angry perhaps, but you know what? Get your anger dealt with ASAP. All right. Uh, now, I would say, and this is just a, an assumption that I have. You can argue with it. Uh, unhealthy conflict resolution is probably the biggest threat to all seven of these values of authenticity. Okay. You can, you can, if you don't get these three, let's say you're doing pretty good on the other four, but if you don't get these three you're probably not going to do very well on the other four for very long. Because conflict builds up and builds up and builds up. Here's what you got to recognize. In any relationship, you have to accept the fact that you are going to tick each other off at some point in time. I've told you before that if I haven't ticked you off already as your pastor, I will. <laughs> Mark says, yeah, multiple times too, right? <laughs> Maybe so. But if you're married, you're going to tick each other off. If you're dating, you're going to tick each other off. If you're a parent-child related, you're going to, it's going to happen. And Paul says, be ready for when it happens and deal with it in an effective way. Okay? It's part of relationships. A relationship that is built, that, that, is, that, that has no conflict management and resolution is built on a lie. You know what the lie is? Everything's hunky-dory. You've never done anything, honey, to stir me up or get me upset. <laughs> Who wants to believe that one? You're laughing already, Miss Betty. Yeah, I get it, right? Yeah, exactly. Because that's not real. We're, we're, we're people who are going to mess up at times. You're married to a person who's going to mess up. 
You gave birth to children who are going to mess up. Once you teach them how, and that doesn't take very long. No, actually, they don't have to learn how, right? It kind of comes natural at a certain place, right? So let's kind of go to the last two real quickly, and we're going to close up. The sixth value of, and by the way, this is one of those messages, it's a flex. We're going to, we're going to pick up the rest of the outline next week, okay? So don't panic about the, that last session section. Um, the, 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 the sixth value of, of authenticity is what I call motivation. Okay, authentic people do their best to motivate others. They're, they're, and it's not that you have to be some big motivational Tony Robbins kind of speaker. Okay, you, you, you don't have to be like that. I mean, it's, it's your actions, it's your intents, motivate others. And this has to do with speaking to others in ways to help maximize their potential. Okay, authentic people typically are trying to figure out how can I, how can I help my good friend Ed, be a better Ed, right? How can I help Ed be a better Ed, right? You ever thought about that? That is the attitude that we need to have to each other. How can I help him be better? How can you help me be better, right, at what we do? That's what motivation is all about. Look at what Paul says. Paul says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Okay, I'm going to get on a soapbox. Is there really any reason for you to use profanity in any situation? Can any of you really tell me any good that ever came of anything when you're using words that start with an F or a D or have initials like a GD or an S? Can you really give me a case and justify why profanity is necessary? Can anybody make that case? Because I really would like to know. Because I will tell you right now, I see people use it all the time, particularly it's getting worse and worse in the younger generation, among our teenagers and even among our children. All you got to do is go on social media and see what's there, and you can pick out in their little abbreviation things. You can tell by the first letter what the cuss word is. And it's going on now, and it's just like, like drinking water. Am I missing something here? Does it really encourage someone when you use a curse word? Does it? If not, then I'm going to extrapolate the words of Paul and just simply tell you what he would say. Then stop doing it. Because it has no motivational value. If you've got a curse at work as the supervisor to show how tough and powerful you are, or if you've got to use profane language to your spouse to show your power over them, or to your girlfriend, or to your boyfriend, or you to your kid, believe me, you're doing something wrong. You just are. And so you need to really analyze that part of your life because you're not being an encouragement to others when you're using that type of language. It doesn't motivate, and I know that it can only hurt there's really not a lot redeeming about that so motivation comes in speaking to others in ways that help maximize their potential what are you going to say to that person that's going to help them be better that's what paul calls us to he started this whole chapter out and he said i beg you i'm on my knees he said for you to live out your calling it's that important. You don't want to miss this in life. And that is living into and fulfilling your calling. And this is how you do it. And this is how you miss it. The final value of authenticity that Paul brings out is found in verse 32. And I just kind of, two words, I couldn't decide which one, so I gave you two words. Affirmation slash leniency, okay? What does it mean? Accepting others' flaws without complaint look to the person next to you even whether you know him or not and say you're a flawed human being will you do that please will you please do that i'll, I'll sit beside my sister-in-law right i'll do this right you're, you're, you're a flawed human being Sorry. yeah right yeah okay 
And what he's saying is this. Stop focusing on the flaws. Stop focusing on the flaws. It kind of goes back to what we said earlier. Find common ground. Look, we've all got the flaws. Look, help, help people overcome the flaws. Don't complain. I'm not saying ignore them. Don't get me wrong. Again, Pastor, Pastor Chris Shelton talked to us back in March about where Jesus said, he said, look, make sure that before you go after the speck in the other person's eye, that you take care of the log in your eye. Jesus did not say, ignore the speck. He didn't say that. But all he said and all that Paul says is, help them with the speck. Now, take care of your own log before you do that. But make sure you do that, right? But don't ignore it. Help each other with the flaws for that to become something that's better. Get better. If I am a hothead and I get angry all the time, I would hope that you all would help me become more calm. Does that make sense? And that's what Paul tells us that we are to do with each other. It's what we are to do as we live the life that Jesus wants us to live. He says, look, he says, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Are you kind of glad that God offers forgiveness? Huh? What would we do without it? What would we do without it? And so he says, because he has forgiven us, we should offer this same forgiveness to others. And in the context of forgiveness, you know, but I forgive you, man, you don't even know it, but you really hurt me, and you really, you, you really said something that, that really bothered me, and I took, I, I, I took it personally, and it hurt. And I, hopefully I'll apologize in a proper way, but then maybe I might say, you know, I realize I say things like that sometimes, and I, I don't, I got to get better at that. You know, can I kind of, can we develop, you know, an agreement that I can talk through this with you some and kind of talk about whether I'm doing better on this or not? Because I want to get better at this. You see, the seven values of authenticity that we talked about, they are all about being aligned with God's per principles and his purposes and his plan, right? He wants us to live in healthy relationships. Why? Here's why. Because life is really only about two things when you get down to it. It's about relationships and the decisions you make about relationships. Now, that might, that's debatable because that's my original, okay? I understand if you disagree, okay? But I really kind of think of it when life, when it's down to it, life is about relationships and the decisions we make about them. Principally, the relationship with Jesus being the most important one. When that one is working and that one is healthy, then you know what I've discovered? There's a tendency for all the other ones to kind of line up pretty well. And so if you're having problems you know, with relationships, and you've got to say, I've got to look at relationship A1, which is a relationship with Jesus. Number one, is there a relationship with Jesus? And number two, in what condition is it? What condition is it in? I'm not sure I said that right, but you know what I'm saying, right? Because when we get that one right, it's amazing how all the other ones kind of begin to line up. Now, it doesn't, ha it doesn't, that doesn't happen overnight, okay? But when we walk consistently in alignment with his principles over time, if we truly do these things we're talking about, you'll be amazed. You'll be amazed at how conflict, how conflict will be healthy, and there is such a thing as healthy conflict. There will always be conflict. Can I tell you that? The question is, will it be healthy? Will it be healthy? If you have no conflict, and you say, oh, I don't have any conflict in my life, you're just lying to yourself. It's there, you're just avoiding it. You're ignoring it. God wants us to use these principles in order to deal with the other people that we will have relationships with in our lives. Let's pray together. Father, Kind of a tough message um, because it strikes at the heart of all of us. We all, this stuff applies to all of us, and every one of us are, are doing pretty well on some of these and maybe not so well on others. But the reality is they all apply on a daily basis. 
And so, Father, I, I know that because of that, it's kind of tough sometimes to talk about these things in ways that maybe don't make us feel bad or offend. And so I, I ask you today, if there's anything that I said that was not of you today, that you would just strike it from the memory of the people that are here. But God, help us to take what you want us to take. You've spoken to each of us individually in different ways. And Lord, my prayer right now is that for each person in this room and each person that was here in the first service today, that whatever they heard from you is that which they will take away. And that is what they'll act on. And so the challenge today is twofold. Number one, if you're a Christ follower, you know that you're living for Jesus, you've asked him to be your savior, and you know without a doubt that if you would die today, you would go to heaven. And by the way, don't, don't just flippantly make that assumption. Because the Bible says that we have to believe in the blood of Jesus and we have to accept his gift of eternal life. And the evidence of having received him is change. If there's been no change in your life, then please don't just assume that you know Jesus. But if you do, and if you know you're walking with him, then the challenge today is simply answer this question. Did God speak to me today? Did he speak to me about something? You know, it could have been something that didn't even have anything to do with the content of this message. But maybe it did. But did God speak to you? And if God spoke to you, that's a challenge for you to work on something, to get better, to get more in line with His plan for you. And so with that, I'd love for you to respond by simply checking on your Connect card, the one that both Ray and Christy have talked to you about today, where it says, I'm accepting God's challenge. I would encourage you to do that. And our prayer team will pray for you, godly men and women who love to pray for our people. Here's the second part of the challenge. Maybe you're here today, and truth be told, maybe you're struggling with this stuff, and maybe the reason is you don't, you don't have the presence of the Holy Spirit yet. And maybe you haven't truly given your life to Him and said, God, I really want you to be the director of my life. And if that's the case, and you're not sure that if you were to die today, you would go to heaven, then you know what? I would love for you to make that decision. Integrity Church would love for you to make that decision here today. It simply would involve, in a committed, heartfelt way, praying a prayer that goes something like this. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me and for raising up again. I, I don't really understand a lot of that stuff, but I trust you but I trust you. After all, that's what trust is. It's trusting even when I don't understand everything. And so, Lord, I trust you for doing that and ask you to forgive me of my sins. I want to turn away from those sins and begin a new life. Save me, give me your gift of eternal life, and help me to learn to grow to where my life is in alignment with yours. If you prayed that prayer today for the first time, or maybe you prayed it before, but today was a new day, a first time you really meant that prayer, then I want you to check where it says, I'm accepting Jesus for the first time. On that card. And we will contact you this week to talk to you about how you can take that step and the next steps you need to take. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. We've sung about it already today. And Lord, we're going to sing about it again. And God, thank you that because of your faithfulness, we can live in authenticity. Serving you and serving others in a way that brings honor to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.